director for Bioshock. And uh, yeah, you've changed the setting. It's not underwater anymore. It is. You, yeah, it's a good observation. It's not underwater anymore. It's pretty impressive. Very impressive. Um, you know, for us, after um, for the Irrational as a studio, we sort of had said what we needed to say about Rapture, about the city of Rapture. And so um, for us, if, if we wanted to do another Bioshock game, and there were certain principles that we thought made a Bioshock game, you know, namely the fact that you know, you're in this, you are in an incredible environment that feels strange and weird and different, but still sort of like believable and grounded in some ways in, in the human experience. And also that you have all these amazing powers that you, you drive the action based upon the powers you choose to use. Those are the two principles that made a Bioshock game to us, not necessarily the location. And um, we wanted to get the franchise back to a place where, you remember when you first saw the original Bioshock, there was sort of a, a WTF vibe. You know, what am I, see- what am I seeing here? What is this? And, um, you know, yeah, and not quite understanding what you were getting into. We need to get the franchise back to that place. And so a new location was critical for that. And it was one of the first ideas we had was the notion of a, of a city in the sky. And you've, you've said that Bioshock, the, the first part was set in the 50s. Now we've, we, we moved back in time as well. Yep. Why did you do that? Um, well, you know, to, to us, we always try to look for time periods. You know, Bioshock 1 was set in 19, late 50s, early 60s. Um, and because that was a time period that hasn't been her- heavily explored in games. You know, look at World War II and then you see Vietnam. You know, that's sort of, you know, in between there, there's nothing. Um, and in um, gaming, you have, like, you know, certainly you have the you know, Napoleonic, you know, in Europe or the American Civil War. And then you have World War I and nothing in between that. And we just like to find periods of time that are sort of interesting and fascinating. And this period of time, I think, you know, as we start talking about it, um, where there's two things happening. One is you have this incredible change in technology you have, you know, if you think about 20 or 30 years before the game takes place, it's 1880, people are living on farms, no running, you know, that no, no indoor plumbing, horse and buggy. And then 20, 30 years later, radio, light, electricity, um, movies, movie stars, automobiles, airplanes. And, you know, we have the internet in the last 20 years. Imagine 10 internets that, you know, that those kind of innovations that changed people's life. I mean, electricity, just think what that did for people's lives, how much it changed it. And um, the world had changed so much that if you had said to somebody back then, do you think you might be living in a city in the sky in five years? They might have said, maybe, you know, it just totally changed the world. And people were incredibly optimistic of what technology would do for them. There's also in America... Um, We were a a relatively small regional power up till this point. You know, we had been through our own civil war and we lost, you know, uh, 620,000 people, which would be like losing 6 million people today for a country of that size. And we weren't interested in imperial endeavors. We weren't interested in being on the world stage. We were just sort of interested in minding our own business. But we had all these products to sell now. You know, we had all these cars and all these, you know, electric light bulbs and all these things. And we needed markets. And you know, ports in Asia, like the Philippines, started to become much more interesting to us. And um, so the American mission started to change. The technology change was optimism in both of these ideas. And we just thought that was an amazing setting for, um, for, for a game. What really struck me in, in the demo is that it's not dark anymore all the time. Do you have the horror theme to, uh, uh, still in the, in the Bioshock Infinite or uh, is, it, is it gone entirely? No, I mean, I think you probably saw there are certain moments in the demo that are quite strange and disturbing and off-putting. And that's, for us, that was a really interesting creative challenge is how do you walk away from the sort of stark, dark and stormy night kind of feel, the sort of like nighttime feel, which is very traditional for horror and relatively easy to get across horror ideas. And how do you do this, you know, sunlight and this for, for um, Americana July 4th feeling of the middle of summer and 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 and. and birds and bees buzzing and flowers and how do you make that horrifying and we look at directors like film directors like david lynch you know you think of blue velvet the opening of blue velvet with that beautiful grass field and the ear sitting in the grass or you think of the shining with you know this antiseptic fluorescent lights and those girls standing at the end of the corridor and you know how horrifying that is and we're trying to challenge ourselves and stretch ourselves to not rely upon things we had done before but to be successful, but using totally different a- approaches. Because once you start repeating yourself, you know, creatively, the audience senses that. Like many other games, you've introduced a female sidekick to Bioshock. What was the motivation behind that? Um, that was also about not repeating ourselves. Um, not about the, the, the looks or something. Well, to target a new audience, 
Well, you know, if, when we thought about Elizabeth, you know, the easy part is let's make an attractive woman with a nice body, and, and that's, that's not hard. You know, most good artists can do that. The challenge is how do you build, how do you forge a connection between the player and that character? How do you make a relationship between that character? And we have several, we've been focusing on several techniques. Um, one is that, you know, I, we went back to talk about what makes people f- become friends, what makes people care about each other in real life. Well, because you, you, you do things for each other, you sacrifice for each other. And you saw that moment in the demo where she's, you're, she's using her powers and she collapses on the ground, the blood comes out of her nose. She's not a superhero. Helping you hurts her, it hurt her, physically hurt her, dam- wounded her. And, the fact that she does that for you, it, it brings out a feeling of, of, of companionship in you. Um, this, you know, despite the fact that she's physically attractive or, or well-shaped, that's far secondary. That's, those are ephemeral things. The fact that she, does, she cares about you and you care about her and that you'll make sacrifices for each other is, I think, important. And for us, we didn't want her to be there. There were a lot of games with their female sidekicks where basically they shoot at the enemies with you, but they can't really... You don't want them to take out all the enemies for you because that's not interesting. You don't want them to be completely useless. And we didn't want to go there at all. Basically, we wanted to have Elizabeth be a function of she sets up these situations for you. And you can, you know, you saw in the demo. Like combo move or yes. And I want to be clear. You don't have to take her up on those combos. You know, you can completely ignore her doing those things. And you could still, like that guy on the bridge, you could have used your regular Bioshock sort of suite of tools to take that guy out if you wanted to. You don't have to have to take that bridge down with Elizabeth, um, but she presents opportunities for you because we always wanted it to be player driven. But when you when you do combine your powers with hers, you get these ama- you can get these amazing, incredible things you had never really seen in a Bioshock game before because you just couldn't do things on that scale before. And so this combination of this narrative connection you have with her, and the fact that you can integrate your powers with her to do things you just couldn't do before, is what was really interesting to us, and I think what's innovative about Elizabeth. When we watch the the demo, the the hero has all these these great powers. Is this uh, demo set in the beginning of the game, or, or uh, has he to earn these these powers? We, we tend to do demos that are not necessarily even moments from the actual game. Like if you look at Bioshock One, they rep- they feel representative of of the product. Now, to be clear, also this demo is not focused on. Um, This is 10 minutes from the game because it's much more action oriented. Um, it's much more outdoor environment because we're trying to show things that are different than previous games. There will be plenty of indoor environments in the game. There will be plenty of those intimate little Bioshock moments where you come across a corner and you see this little corner of the room and there's a little story to be told there. You know, you're listening to some, some, some recording of somebody and you have this little intimate moment. We'll have tons of those as well. But we really want to focus the demo on what's different from previous Bioshock games. So our hero isn't all, almighty from, from the get-go? No, not at all. He's a, regu- he's a regular guy who, who just happens to have been in a few scrapes before. What can you tell me about a multiplayer mode? Um, we, the way we think about, you know, there was no multiplayer in Bioshock 1. And we didn't work on Bioshock 2. Um, the way we think about, the rationals of the studio thinks about multiplayer is that if we have something, we experiment with different things all the time. If we have something to say about multiplayer, so, uh, a statement to make um, in the game, it'll have to be something that's as meaningful, as important as the rest of the game or we're not going to have it there because we don't think there's a creative advantage. We don't think there's a business advantage to doing that. Um, I think people just want to check a box often. And um, so we're not, we're not talking about anything now because we haven't made that determination yet, but it's something we, you know, it's something we, we think about and experiment with, but who knows? There could be, who, who knows what there could, who knows what there could be, but it would only be if we believe that it's something that is going to be as meaningful as the rest of the game. Ken, thank you very much. Your words are dangerous. Your talk is cheap. 